Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 will begin today at the third verse, and we're going to read through verse 14. It's about 12 verses in total. Philippians 3, 3 through 14. Want to talk to us on the topic today? Homesick. Amen. Homesick. Philippians 3, 3 through 14, the King James text today reads, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, listen, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, meaning I followed all the rules. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might obtain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Master, we love you. We thank you today for the Word of God. We thank you for the presence of the Lord Hallelujah. in the house of God. No yes. matter how simple our worship may be, Lord, it is not an issue of instruments. It is not an issue of numbers. It is a matter of the heart. Is our heart right with God? Do we worship you, Lord, in sincerity and in truth? And yes, Lord, that is the spirit with which we come into the house of God. Lord, we need the anointing today. This preacher needs the touch of the Holy Ghost if I am to deliver the word of the Lord today for the benefit of your people. Touch my lips. More importantly, touch the ear of every hearer. Cultivate our hearts today. Let that stony ground that fallow ground be torn up and made ready to receive the engrafted word of God.
For we ask it today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, Paul begins this chapter to the church at Philippi by saying to them, you want to know who a real child of Abraham is. You want to know who a real Jew is, who a real Israelite is. He said, well, I'll tell you who they are. They are those, listen, which worship God in the Spirit. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, not every church today worships in the Spirit. There are many people who don't even know what it is to worship in the Spirit. No, all of their worship comes from their intellect. All of their worship comes from their heart. But for a Holy Ghost filled fire baptized, tongue token, Jesus name bearing believer, our worship comes from deeper within. Hallelujah. Yes. Even deeper than our mind. Yes. Even deeper than our thoughts. Yes. Even deeper than our heart. Yes, yes. yes. It comes yes. from yes. our spiritual man, which God has breathed life into. By reason of the Holy Ghost. My God. We see people get happy. We see people shout and dance and run the aisles. And people want to think that perhaps um, uh, the Spirit of God has, quote, touched their body. And no, the Spirit of the Lord has not touched their body. The Spirit of the Lord has touched their spirit. Right. And what you're seeing right. is not the manifestation of God touching their body, right. but rather the manifestation of God touching their spirit. Right. But see, if your spiritual man has not yet experienced the CPR, <laughs> that is the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if your spiritual man is still dead in trespass and sin, and it has not yet had that life breathed into it, that it is the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then I promise you, you haven't yet experienced all the depths and the heights and the richest glory of God. Uh, of his touch. You don't know yet how wonderful it can be. You don't know yet how glorious it can be. I'm going to tell you, I've seen people who have serious physical handicaps. In the church of God, we used to have an old preacher, Brother Brett Collins, in Texas. And Brother Collins had had a hip replacement. And they had to put in one of those uh, uh, man-made hip joints, you know. And when he walked, he literally walked like this. Yes, His sir. hip came up and did this right. every step he took. Uh -huh. And he had to walk with a cane. But Brother Collins was an old-time Pentecostal Holy Ghost backpack tongue-talking preacher. And at camp meeting, every camp meeting, uh, the overseer would tap Brother Collins on the shoulder and say, Brother, I want you to lead a song in the choir today. And Brother Collins would get up there in the pulpit and he'd say, Y'all know what I want to say. We never had to guess. We never had to wonder. We knew what his favorite song was. Oh, happy day. That fits my choice. I'm be my Savior and my God. Yes. Long may my wandering heart rejoice. Hallelujah. Oh, he get to sing in that old happy day. We get to sing in that chorus. Happy day, happy day. Since Jesus washed my sins away, he taught me how to watch and pray. And live for joy, sing every day. Oh, happy day, happy day. Since Jesus washed my sins away. And old Brother Collins, he'd be up there leading that choir. 
All of a sudden, you'd see him. Here he was with his cane. He'd be tapping around trying to lead that car. All of a sudden, brother, he dropped that cane. Woo! And he'd start running. Running. Yes, Lord. He'd run around that entire tabernacle in Weatherford, Texas, yes. that could hold a thousand people, big old building. And he'd run around the outside aisle, and oh, he'd run it to it three times, and he'd run like he was some kind of a Olympic sprinter. And he'd come back into that pulpit and he'd land. And he started leading that choir again, and he grabbed his cane. But when the Spirit of God would touch his spirit, I'm going to tell you, when the Spirit of God touches your spirit, there are things you can do in your body you never dreamed you could do. That's right. There are things, people who are crippled can all of a sudden get up and walk. People who are struggling all of a sudden don't have a struggle in them anymore. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've had the Spirit of the Lord touch me in so many services. And oftentimes, when the Lord touches you, sometimes you just get that temporary uh, experience of suddenly being able to run or what have you. But many times, people get their healing. Yes, sir. All of a sudden, <laughs> not only are they able to do it, but they never again have to pick up the cane. But that cane from Brother Collins, apparently, was his thorn in the flesh, you know. That was his hollow in Jacob's thigh that reminded him, you know, to trust the Lord. I don't know. Folks, I want to tell you something. The Apostle Paul said, let me tell you who the true people of God are. That the true people of God are those which worship God in the Spirit. Notice he did not say in spirit. See, the Baptist folk are trying to tell you, well, we worship God in spirit. <laughs> no, you don't. Unless your spirit is engaged, unless your spirit is what is worshiping God and not just your flesh, not just your lips, not just your mouth. Unless your spiritual man has been touched by the Holy Ghost and you are worshiping God from a deeper place. No, you are not worshiping God in the Spirit. But listen, he said, and rejoice in Christ Jesus. You know, people have a lot to say about us old time Pentecostal churches. We shout too much. We make too much noise. We get too happy. Um, honey, I'm sorry. We are the real people of God. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you. We don't just talk about heaven. We rejoice about heaven. We don't just talk about salvation. We rejoice about salvation. We don't just talk about the blood. We rejoice over the blood. I have an aunt, my father's sister. My father's family was not raised in church by a long shot. None of his family ever attended church. When my mother and dad first met, my mother invited some of his siblings to go to church with them. And back then, my family, my grandmother, my, my aunts and uncles were attending a little Jesus named church in Walton, Connecticut, pastored by an incredible man of God, a brother Warren Tatlock, a marvelous, independent man of God. He was not part of the UPC or any other uh, apostolic denomination. He was independent. And my God, what a move of God they had in that church. Brother Tatlock probably had about maybe a hundred or so people, a little over a hundred people. But every service, the Spirit of the Lord had sweep through that place. Them ladies that shout their hair down. Glory to God. You'd have hair pins flying everywhere. You had to make sure you didn't get one in the eyeball. Because that lady, they get to shaking their head, and all of a sudden, them hair pins just start flying everywhere. Which way? My Aunt Susan, my father's sister, said to me many years ago, she since has passed. And she married a man who had a daughter from a previous marriage. Her daughter, his daughter was 
in Jesus' name, believe her. She was part of the UPC in Waterbury, Connecticut. And my aunt told me, she said, Chuck, ever since your, your mother and your grandmother brought us to Brother Tapo's church when we were kids, she said, I can't go into any other kind of church but a Pentecostal church. She said, I can't do it. She said, when I was young, I went to that church. She said, and my God, the way those people worship. She said, man, they shouted, they ran the aisles, they danced, they hollered, they hooped, they jumped, they leaped. She said, but I'll tell you one thing. They believed what they preached and they preached what they believed. She said, you could feel their sincerity. You could feel their faith. You could feel that the things they were singing about and the things they were preaching about were not just some sort of off-in-the-distance spiritualized things. No, these were real to them. She said, man, they get to talking about heaven, and all of a sudden they were running and dancing and shouting. She said, they get to talking about the cross, and all of a sudden they get to dancing and shouting. She said, they get to talking about the empty tomb, and all of a sudden they get to dancing, and they get to shouting. I'll tell you why. Because a real child of God is one who worships God in the spirit and rejoices in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. But listen to this last qualifier. Paul said, and has no confidence in the flesh. There's a lot of Jesus named churches today full of people. They may worship in spirit. They may rejoice in Christ Jesus. But they make one fatal error. And that is, they have confidence in the flesh. They trust that somehow their works and their actions, their deeds, oh, dare I say it, their standards, somehow give them position in God. Paul said, I could, if anybody in the world could rejoice in the flesh, he said, I could. He said, let me tell you something that I'm not going to go point for point. But he said, basically, he was saying, honey, you couldn't have been a better Jew than I was. I was a Pharisee. I used to persecute the church. I was so full of zeal. He said, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, I never broke any of the rules. I followed every rule there was to follow. He said, if anybody in this world had the right to rejoice and have confidence in the flesh, he said, I did. He said, oh, but then I came to a knowledge of Jesus. And guess what I found out? I found out all of that stuff didn't mean nothing. Hmm. Said, here I spent all my life following the rules. Here I spent all my life trying to do right by the law. Here I spent all of my life being zealous and persecuting others because of my religion. He said, and guess what? When I came face to face with Jesus, I found out that none of these things meant anything. And I had to let go of all of them. And this is what he's talking about when he said, I count all things but loss. He's not talking about losing his income. He's not talking about losing his finances. He's not talking about losing his health. No, he's saying all the spiritual investment that I had made, I discovered was useless. Therefore, I had to discard it. But you know what? I threw away years of my religious effort. I'm going to tell you, there are people who come into the church and they hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ, but they will not let go of their past. They will not let go of the religion they grew up in or the religion they've been part of for so many years. Why? I've got too much invested in it. I can't just throw all that away. I've been in the Jehovah's Witness for 40 years. I can't just throw it away. Oh, yes, you can. 
that we should walk in them. In Philippians 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We are a work in progress, folks. But the interesting thing is, most churches, most preachers, even Pentecostal preachers, will tell you, yeah, you're a work in progress, and guess who's doing all the work? You are. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Wrong. For we are His workmanship. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to perfect myself. He's trying to perfect me. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. He is the potter. I'm just the clay. Right. It's not about my effort. It's not about my work. There ain't a clay pot on the planet that ever made itself. No. Somebody had to mold that clay. Somebody had to make that pot out of it. Yes. Yes. Oh, I want to tell you, yes. when you understand New Testament salvation, yes. it's not about your it's not about what you can do. It's about what you can allow. Listen, what you can allow God to do with you. Can we submit to Him? Can we yield to Him? Can we allow Him to make changes in our life? Well, I'll tell you, I've had the Holy Ghost slap me upside the head a few times in my life. People think, ah, oh, you're just talking to yourself. When you say you hear the voice of God speaking to you, you're just talking to yourself. I hope not, because I've said some things to myself that really hurt. I've said some things to myself I really didn't want to hear. It wasn't me talking to myself. It was the Spirit of the Lord telling me, hey, fool. <laughs> hey, boy, you know better than that. You know better than that. Haven't you ever been there? Have you ever said something, done something, and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost comes along and say, hey, Hey, you know that in the past. That's right. That's right. Now you go back and apologize. I've had to go back to neighbors and apologize for the way I acted, the things I said, because the Holy Ghost gave me a slap and said, uh uh, no, you know better than that. First John 3 and 2, I, I frequently make reference to this passage, but there's a reason because I think. It is a passage that probably gets the least amount of attention in the church world today, but it's one of the most important. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know. Hallelujah. Not we believe, not we think, not we hope, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall see, excuse me, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. We are a work in progress. There's not a believer on this planet that walks in godly humility who thinks they have achieved any level of perfection. I had somebody not too long ago decided he wanted to help set the preacher straight. He read something I put on Facebook and didn't think I should have written it. Now mind you, it wasn't like I said anything ungodly. It wasn't like I said anything, you know, hateful or hurtful or mean. No, but no, Pastor, you know, you're not supposed to share your feelings like that because that, that's not what pastors are supposed to do. And I'm here to help straighten you out because the Bible said if you see your brother overtaken in a fall, then you're to help them. I said, yeah, the Bible also said you better take the beam out of your own eye before you look at the sliver in that's the brain. The yeah, that's, that's the word. That's the word. So I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you look at Jesus' words, let me tell you what the Lord was saying. The Lord was not saying, work on yourself first and then you'll be in a position. No, no, listen to me. 
the comparison he was making was a beam to a sliver. So what he was saying was, if you start looking at yourself, you'll realize you ain't got time to be worried about the other guy. <laughs> That's what the Lord was really saying. Right. He was saying, now, you know what? You, if you look at what you got in your own life, you're going to realize you ain't got to be bothered with that guy because, honey, you got so much to work on compared to what he's got to work on. You ain't got time to be bothered with him. And I'm going to tell you, the word of God said, brethren, listen, if any man be overtaken in a fault, where was my fault? What, what was my weakness that would cause me to behave in an ungodly manner? Nothing. That, that wasn't part of the issue. But see how people in the church just love to, oh, I'm going to help fix you, brother. I'm going to set you straight. I'm gonna. This person had no humility. No. None. None. This person thought themselves perfect. This person thought he was so righteous and so in such a great, much younger than I. And I had to laugh. I'm, I'm listening to him and I'm listening to him talk. And honestly, I, I didn't show it to him, but on the inside I was going to. <laughs> this child, this boy, man, I'll tell you what, I hope when he hits my age, he looks back and realizes, I'm going to say it plain now, what a jackass he made out of himself today. I hope one day he looks back and realizes what a fool he made out of himself. Because the word of God said, they which are spiritual ought to restore such a one in the spirit of what? Meekness. Yes. This guy told me, well, I'll tell you, I've got this many divinity degrees and I went to Bible college and I this and I that literally was telling me all this. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, son, you're talking to somebody who has no interest in divinity degrees, who has no interest in education whatsoever, because I'm old enough to know you can have degrees on your wall, still be the biggest idiot on the planet. We got a guy running for president who's got a degree on his wall, and he's about as bright as a half a watt bulb. <laughs> talking about Windmills create electricity. Well, there ain't no wind. You have no electricity. How stupid are you, mister? I've got an electric power windmill up at my property in Oklahoma. Eight acres off grid, no, no electric lines, no gas lines, no water line. I've got to bought myself a windmill. Guess what that windmill does? First of all, you put it high enough and there's always wind. Always. Always. Wind does not always affect us at the ground level, but there's always atmospheric wind. That's why, if you notice, those windmills they put up are huge and they're way up in the air. Okay? And you'll notice that even if they're not spinning like a fan, they're always moving. That's They're right. constantly moving That's all right. the time. That's right. And what they do, brother, is as they turn, they're creating an electric current by reason of magnets. They use magnets. And they create that positive uh, flow. And the electricity then goes to storage. Batteries. Mm -hmm. And when you need the power, you draw it from the battery. So we got a dignitary running for president who thinks that in order for wind power to work, the thing has to be spinning while you're doing what you're trying to do. Idiot. But the man has a degree on his wall. So you think I give a flying thing about your degree? No. You're talking to the wrong guy. I've preached from my pulpit for decades. You go to a Bible college, 
you go to a seminary, you go to a university that is associated with any religious denomination or movement, listen, and they are going to teach you their belief system. They're not necessarily going to teach you the Word of God. Now, some of what they teach may be in perfect keeping with the Word of God, but some of what they teach may be completely contradictory to the Word of God. And people come and say, well, I got a degree from this school, and that's for y'all, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what's your point? Let me tell you what degree I've got. I've got a degree from Holy Ghost University because my Bible said, Ye have no need that any man teach you, but the anointing which ye have received of God shall teach you all things. So everything I've learned, I've learned from God. Everything you learned, you learned from some man somewhere. And if his thinking was right, well then you lucked out. If his thinking was wrong, uh-oh. So now you got a bunch of bad teaching. Now you got a bunch of bad thinking in your head. Am I telling the truth today? But I want to tell you, people, it is amazing how people are so quick to jump in and try to fix somebody else or help somebody else. Real quick, real quick. Oh, but children, let me tell you something. Where is humility? See, my humility oftentimes, listen, prevents me from opening my mouth. Amen. My humility. Sometimes I'll see something and I'll say, I'm not sure that's right. I'm not sure that's how they ought to do. I'm not sure that's what they ought to be doing or how they ought to be doing it. <sighs> but you know what? I, I'm in no place to be I'm telling them. No place. I'm, I'm not in any place to be trying to fix them. But you know what the Word of God teaches? We ought to pray for them. Yes. yes. See, people who think they got to fix everybody else are people who have no confidence in God. Mm. Yes. It's the truth. They have no confidence in God. They don't believe God can do it. They don't believe God can help that person. God can fix that person. The Lord can lead that person to the place they need to be. I'm going to tell you, I had a young man at my first affirming church in New York City. After every single service, Sunday service, he would say, Oh, I'm going to this bar, I'm going to that club to meet up with my friend. And on the inside, I'd be like, ah! <laughs> I mean, how in the world? Because we just had a wonderful service. The presence of God was there. And he's talking about going to a stinking old club or a bar to meet up with his friend. And I'm thinking, Lord, oh Lord. But you know what I said on the outside? I said this. Oh, yeah? That's what I said. Didn't say a word. Kept my mouth shut. But then when he went home, I went to pray. I said, Lord, Brian needs you. Lord, Brian needs you. He needs you to step in. He, he still thinks somehow, some way, that you can walk out of the presence of God and walk into an environment that's completely opposite that and that all is well with the world. Now, I'm not saying by going to hell for doing it. No, I'm not saying that at all. But it wasn't the best for him spiritually to go because all he's going to do is go from a godly environment to an ungodly environment and he's going to nullify all the benefits he got from being in church. So I got to pray. Well, months passed. Finally, one day, Brian got up in church. He said, you know, I got to testify. He said, you know, said, uh, and he, I'm not going to give this whole story because I don't have time today. But he said, uh, I've really been lonely and I've been struggling and I've always kind of had a mindset that I'd rather have a one night stand and not have anything at all because I had to raise my brother and my sister after my parents died and it was hard and I was constantly by myself. 
and I just would find myself wanting some human companionship, you know. And he said, and honestly, I'd go to the bars, I'd go to the club, I'd hope maybe I could meet somebody that at least I'd have some companionship for the night. He said, but you know what? He said, since I've been coming to this church, he said, the other day I went home after work and I was at home doing laundry and stuff. And he said, all of a sudden something dawned on me. He said, I hadn't even thought about it. He said, I sat there and I said, you know what? It's been two months since I've even been to a bar. It's been two months since I've even been to a club. He said, you know, he said, ever since I've been coming to this church and my walk with God has grown and and." And I felt the Lord's presence and His power in my life. He said, now, even when I go home and I'm alone, I don't feel alone. Amen. See, I didn't have to say a word. But these self-righteous know-it-alls, they'll act like, oh, if the pastor doesn't set him straight, he's not doing his job. No, no, wrong. The pastor believes God. I believe that God is able. I believe that God answers prayer. I believe that if we will approach things in a constructive manner, if we'll pray for one another like we're supposed to pray for one another, that God will do the work because we are all praying in the Father's hands. We are work in progress and it is God who is working in and with each and every one of us. Right. So if that person needs work, guess what? They don't need you working on them. They need God working on them. Say that. That's it. That's, it. That's, that's, it. Person. that's it. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, listen to me. That's it. Well, heavens, I've got so many scriptures here. Okay, one cannot desire to be somewhere that they are already convinced that they're there. You can't get anybody to want to go home if they have already convinced themselves they're home. I have an aunt who suffered from dementia. Sometimes she thinks she was somewhere she wasn't. So if you tried to tell her, hey, let's go home, she said, what are you talking about? I am home. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of Christians who are suffering from dementia. Hey, we need to be striving toward perfection. We need to be striving toward godliness. We need to be striving toward holiness. What are you talking about? I'm already there. Oh, no, you ain't. Can't convince anybody to go somewhere if they think they've already arrived. You can't get an individual with dementia excited about going home if they already believe they're home. One cannot long for holiness and perfection if they've convinced themselves they're already holy and perfect. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul makes clear that he is fully aware of his imperfection. He goes on to say that while he has every right to rejoice in the flesh or to celebrate perfection as defined by the law of Moses, he still says, but I don't do so. In fact, he says that he considers all the rules, the regulations, the achievements and accomplishments that he has under his belt in the flesh to have all been laid down and discarded so that he might instead become the servant and the position of Christ. In fact, he begins his statement in our primary to, uh, text today by saying that a true Jew is one who is able to worship in the spirit and celebrate Jesus Christ 
while not putting faith or confidence in the flesh. Oh, hallelujah. I'm a real Christian because I tell you what, I don't put any confidence in the flesh. John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus said to the woman at the well, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, John writes, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's right. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Yes, Lord. It is the will of God that we pursue holiness. Yes righteousness and godliness. It is also His will that we worship in spirit and in truth. Yes. Now the latter, the worship we're able to do fully while the former, the pursuit of holiness, we are able only to do in part. But if you work in a factory and you are working on piecework. I worked in a factory in Connecticut many years ago as a young man. And we had what they call piecework. And I used to load machines for the ladies and they had to uh, uh, pack these uh, materials and uh, put them in boxes and get them ready to ship. And if they met their quota, if they produced over their quota, they would make money for each additional uh, piece they made, you know, after their quota. Well, I used to keep their machines full so constantly and regularly that they were easily able to make well over their quota because there was never any downtime. I never let their machines get empty. When I saw it getting empty, I'd go get another barrel and I'd dump those pins in it and get it ready to go. And finally, the ladies came to me and they said, Charles, please don't do that. I said, go to the bathroom once in a while. Take a break. Go smoke a cigarette. I said, I don't smoke. They said, we don't care. They said, do something. Slow down. I said, why is our show on peace work? And they said, yeah. I said, well, don't you make money if you do over your quota? They said, yeah. They said, but you know what? You are making us so we can consistently make way over our quota. You know what that means? That means they're going to send somebody down here to retime us. Which means that our quota is going to go up. And they're going to expect us to produce that. Right. every day right. and she said said no 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 we want our quota right where it's at <laughs> said but you know we don't mind making a few extra boxes to make a few extra bucks but we don't want to be retired yes. well the bottom line is this if you're in pursuit of holiness if you're in pursuit of righteousness you may never produce as much as you might could produce, but you're producing. You may never get to the place of perfection, but you're on the way. Mm -hmm. You may never be truly uh, as holy and as godly and as righteous as you would like to be, but you are in pursuit of that end. Amen. Praise God. And that is what God has called us to. He has called us to the pursuit of holiness. He does not tell us to possess holiness. But when you hear preachers preach, they love to quote uh, uh, Hebrews and they love to say, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Uh-huh. What's the key word in that sentence? 
follow. Mm. Paul saying, pursue. Pursue two things. Not one thing, two things. Say pursue peace with all men. Right. Try to live in peace with right. all men. And holiness. So you're pursuing two things. Peace with all men right. and holiness. Right. He said, if you're not in pursuit of these two things, you can't ever see God. Well, why not? Because God is the personification of holiness. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. Yes. I'm going to tell you, the thing I look forward to most when it comes to heaven, I, I love the idea of family reunions. I love the idea of seeing grandma again. I love the idea of seeing loved ones. I have a, an aunt who is mentally retarded, literally, severely. She was institutionalized as a teenager. My grandmother nearly had a nervous breakdown because she hated to have to institutionalize her daughter, but she couldn't handle her. I believe my aunt today is sitting on the streets of glory woo, with a sound mind <laughs> able to have a conversation able to talk to me. when my little retarded aunt bless her heart later in life as I got older she uh, was in an institution and she had to be hospitalized she had some illness and I went to the hospital to see her. My grandmother said, CJ, I appreciate you doing it, but it's why. She said, Audrey doesn't know you. She doesn't, she, she doesn't have a clue who you are. She's, I mean, she's very severely mentally handicapped, you know. And she said, you're going there, but it's not accomplishing anything. I said, oh, yes, it is. I said, because in heaven, we're going to have something to talk about. Hallelujah. When we see each other on the streets of glory, I'm going to say, Audrey, you remember when you got sick and I came to the hospital to see you? And she's going to say, yes, sir, I remember you brought the ice cream. Hallelujah. See, I believe these things. I believe when we get to glory that that which is broken and fixed, that which is not as Working is working. Yes, yes. That which does not function, yes. functions. Oh, my God. Oh, children, I'm homesick today. I'm like the soldier in my illustration coming home from his deployment. How many days did he sit on the field of battle? How many days did he sit in his barracks and long to be home? This world, the old song says, is not my home. I'm just passing through. Right. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Brother, when I see all the fighting, when I see all the negativity, the angst, when I see the stupidity that goes on, the lying, the deceit in our world. Yes. When I see the political upheaval that our nation is in, yes. all it does is make me long for home even more. All it does is make me even more homesick. I know that one day all of this angst and negativity, excuse me, negativity and hatred is going to be a thing of the past. Yes. You won't see that foolishness in my God's heaven. Hallelujah. You're not going to see all that foolishness in my God's heaven. And I begin to long for home. I say, oh God. Oh Lord, you couldn't come soon enough for it. This world is just not a place that suits us believers. Yes. Because we believe in peace. Yes. We believe in unity. Yes. We believe in harmony. Yes. We believe in cooperation. Yes. We believe in charity. We believe in love. Yes. We believe in mercy. We yes. believe in grace. Yes. And Lord, those things are not, they're not in big supply here on planet Earth. And how I long for heaven. 
But oh, I'll tell you, the thing I long for most about heaven, and I'm trying to close because I have a lot more notes, but I'll have to split this message up, I guess. I want to tell you, the thing about heaven I look for the most is not the family reunion. I could care less about streets of gold. Heaven could have cement roads. I'd be fine with it, just as long as it was heaven. But the thing I long for the most is that state of holiness, that state of righteousness, that place where all things are as they ought to be. Amen, amen. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. No more arguing, no more debate, no more negativity, no more strife, no more war, no more condemnation, no more guilt, no more fear. My God, I could go down the list of my own. How could anybody not long for God's heaven? But the thing I look forward to the most, I can tell you in truth, is seeing Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Is seeing Jesus. Paul said, but we know that we shall see him, for we shall be like him. We are today a work in progress, and we are his one. We're his masterpiece. He is making us into what He desires we be. Not us. We're not trying to make ourselves into something to please Him. No. They're in the ashtray in the world that ever designed itself and made itself. So somebody will look at it and say, Boy, I'd like to buy that for my house. There's not a single pot. There's not a single platter anywhere on this planet that made itself and tried to create itself so that it would be appealing to the consumer. No, somebody had to make it. Some artist and some creator had to create it. Children, you and I today are his masterpiece. He has called us unto good works, meaning as He works in us and through us, guess what? We're going to be doing good things. We're going to be doing things. We're going to bless people. We're going to help people. We're going to encourage people. We're going to inspire people. Why? Well, you can't help it because that's how God made me. <laughs> it's not about what I'm trying to do. Yes. No. That's when I got the Holy Ghost, I run every street sign, every light post, every tree that I looked at. I'll never forget the night I received the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, I come out of that church that night, got in the car, and as my grandmother drove me home, I was looking, and I mean, I loved everything. I was so in love. I loved the dog next to the fire hydrant. I loved the fire hydrant. I loved the blades of grass. I loved the sidewalk. Oh, you know why? Not because I was trying to love these things but because the Spirit of God within me simply caused this abundance of love to pour out of me. Yes. Oh, as God works on you, as God works in you, as God works through you, oh, I will tell you, you're going to find yourself doing a lot of good things. You're going to find yourself not doing a lot of bad things. But you know what? You don't have to try to do the good things. Hey, and you don't have to try not to do the bad things. No. Because you're simply going to be doing, listen to me, what you were designed to do. Oh, hallelujah. And he has designed us unto good works. I'm homesick. I look forward to heaven. I want to see Jesus. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?